Yep, we'll start to record this meeting, and uh, thanks to everybody who attended our terrestrial one yesterday and is coming back for a second time. You get extra APIP gold stars for doing that, and um, we're thrilled to have you back, so this will be pretty similar. This is our roundtable meeting where we get together in the wintertime, and we get to talk about all the different projects and things that we're planning and excited and looking forward to the year and provide some updates. Um, and so uh, I'm also like Tamara. Uh, I usually like to start off with like a like a reading or a story or something. And so I was kind of thinking about what I was going to say. And then um, my executive director, Bill Oldfelder, he actually sent an, uh, an email that had a, a quote. And I was like, oh, that's a that's a great quote for what I'm what we're going to be doing today. So um, so we're going to start with this. And, you know, we're here in the wintertime. And we have people uh, who are still here in the Adirondacks or people down in Florida. We had people from Mexico yesterday uh, join us in. So, you know, winter time is traditionally associated with, with a time of darkness, a time of, um, you know, quiet and reflection. And so there's this quote uh, from the, the book uh, called Upstream by Mary Oliver on an essay called Winter Hours. And the, the quote from it is, in the winter, I am writing about there was much darkness darkness of nature, darkness of event, darkness of the spirit, the sprawling darkness of not knowing. We speak of the light for a reason. I would speak here of the darkness of the world and the light of, but I don't know what to call it. Maybe hope, maybe faith, but not a shaped faith, only say a gesture or a continuum of gestures, but probably is closer to hope. That is more active and far messier than faith must be. And I thought that was a really good quote for us because, uh, you know, many times working on aquatic invasive species issues, they are messy and they are difficult. And it is time, it is hard when you are at the bottom of the mountain to have that that hope and to have that uh, that light to see there. So, um, you know, I'm continually inspired by by all of you and all of our things and the people that who can find you know, that light and that hope in dark times. Uh, I'm very lucky that I get to live in Saranac Lake. And for over a hundred years, our community has been trying to celebrate and find light in the darkness. And we have this great event called Winter Carnival. And this is a picture of the Ice Palace here in town. If you haven't ever been here, I highly recommend coming to it. And uh, I think it's just a great example of, you know, getting people out, staying hopeful, staying active, even in, in the, the darkness of winter. So we're going to do a little bit of that kind of collective hope uh, right now and um, go through this. We're going to do some welcomes and introductions. Um, after that, we'll have our public partners, the Adirondack Park Agency, uh, APIP ourselves, the DEC, and Lake Champlain Basin Program. Um, they'll provide us uh, about five minutes of updates. Um, themselves, and then we're just going to go into a round table discussion where anybody on the call can, will go through and be able to share uh, projects or plans or, or things that you need help with or how you want to collaborate in uh, 2024. So um, right now we're going to go through and we're going to do some uh, quick 30 second introductions. You'll have a chance later on to share your different projects and everything. So if you can go through, if you can say your name, you can say if you're part of an organization or if you just want to say where you're located at. Um, and then you can name one thing that you're hopeful for uh, th this year. So I'll go first. My name is Brian Green. I am the Aquatic Invasive Species Coordinator. I work for the Nature Conservancy as part of the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program. You'll hear us call that APIP all the time. And um, I'm, I'm hopeful for some good weather this weekend so my kids can do their cross country ski race and we have a good 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 carnival parade in Saranac Lake. Um, so uh, these are, um, I have the names of the people who pre-registered. So we'll just kind of go through them alphabetically and you can come off mute and say your different things. If, you're, if you didn't pre-register uh, at the end, we'll just go through anybody else who we didn't go through. So uh, the first up is a Blake. Hey y'all, um, Blake Newman. I am the clean water advocate with uh, the Adirondack Council, and I am looking forward to the ice harvest on Racket Lake, which I realized I need to figure out the date for. Um, but much as 
what you showed Brian with the uh, ice castle. They're going to haul a bunch of blocks out of the South Bay of Ragged Lake uh, sometime this month. So I'm looking forward to that. Awesome. All right, Bruce. Hi, I'm Bruce Burdout, chairman of the Water uh, Quality Committee for the Mountain View Association, uh, Mountain View Lake, Indian Lake, up in Owl's Head, Mountain View, New York. And uh, we're hoping that we can get a lot of uh, Eurasian water milk oil out of our lakes this summer and have a great boating season. Thank you. Awesome. Carolyn. And if Carolyn's not on, we'll go to Christine. And if Christine's not here, we'll go to Dave. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Dave Wick. I'm the director of the New York State Lake George Park Commission. And uh, one thing I'm hopeful for, uh, I'm hopeful that uh, we can have a fuller and better understanding of milfoil management with the aquatic herbicide Priscillacor. Uh, as some folks may have followed what's going on down here in Lake George, we're in a bit of a pause. And so we just found a new email from our uh, past sister organization, the Lake George Association, um, causing some consternation again. So we're hoping to work with them in a better way and move forward. And we look forward to everybody's insights on how you guys are doing with Priscilla Core and other topics. So happy to be here. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Dave. Uh, David. Yeah, hi, uh, David Wilson. I'm with the Paseco Lake Association. I'm the, the current president. Uh, we have uh, no invasive plant species in Paseco, which we feel fortunate about. Uh, we have boat stewards at three different uh, boat landings or boat launch sites, and they're monitored you know, at least three days a week. So we feel fortunate with that. We do have spiny water flea, though. They came in probably uh, three years ago. Uh, our lake is a, is a lake trout lake, and we're concerned about the uh, plankton in the lake and the effect that the spiny water flea has. So right now, I'm looking at setting up a program starting this summer to uh, do plankton studies of phytoplankton and zooplankton to look at the populations, identify who they are, and watch the population density over the next few years to see if it does change uh, with the spiny water flea and what the spiny water flea population will do. So that's our that's our big project and our big concern at this point. All right, thanks, David. Donna. Hi, um, I am with Peck Lake Preservation Association, and I'm the uh, chair for the Aquatic Invasive Species Program. And we're looking forward to, for the first time, implementing the Lake Protector and the Lake Tracker programs this summer. So that's what I'm kind of hoping it all works out. <laughs> Great. Um, let's see, we'll go to Edward next. Um, hi, thanks. My name is Ed Boyer. I'm uh, I'm in Arizona. However, I spent I've been spending a lot of time in the Adirondacks at Brant Lake. Uh, I work at Prescott College in the uh, Environmental Studies and Sustainability Department here, and I'm on the board with the Brant Lake Association. And I'm hoping to learn more about the uh, milfoil uh, problem and treatment process and all that stuff. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Um, Emily, share, share one thing that you're hopeful for this year. Okay, Emily Tyner from Lake Clear Association, and I'm hopeful to continue enjoying working with the other volunteers, monitoring Lake Clear, and hoping not to find any invasives. That's, always, it. the, all, that's always the hope. Aaron. Yes. <laughs> Hi everyone, Erin Penny Valrath. I'm with New York State DEC out of our Region 5 office in the Adirondacks working on the Lake Champlain Basin. And I am also hopeful for the Winter Carnival Parade. I get to dance in it this year, so I'm excited. Be looking forward to seeing you there. Uh, Ezra. Ezra Schwartzberg from Adirondack Research. Um, with the nice sunny weather that we've had, for the last couple of days, I am hopeful that everybody on this call will have sunshine for the solar eclipse. 
That is, yes, there are a lot of people also hoping for that. Uh, Frank. All right, if Frank's not on, we'll go to Gail. Good morning, Brian. <clears throat> I, I'm Gail Morehouse. I'm the president of the Racket Lake Preservation Foundation. And I guess I'm uh, just hopeful that we can continue to build on some of the momentum that we've uh, experienced in the last couple of years in terms of our public outreach. We're also very much looking forward to trying to find um, a very meaningful research partner in terms of some areas that we're concerned about. Um, <clears throat> of course, the uh, milfoil problem and understanding some of the anom anomalies in it, because of course we, like every other organization has very limited funds and we want to better manage those funds. For example, in areas that milfoil is very, very dense one year and the next year it's, it's hard to find. And with a, a lake the size of Racket, that's, that's a challenge. And also some of the fishery uh, issues that we're concerned about in terms of climate change, HAB, things like that. So that's it, thank you. Oh, and Blake, usually the ice harvest is the day after the winter carnival on Racket. Thanks, Gail. Um, Glenn. All right. Glenn does not uh, uh, hear. We'll go with Greg. Hi, it's uh, Glenn White. I'm a oh. retired statistician, and I happen to have a piece of property that um, borders Moody Pond, and I'm active in that Moody Pond milfoil uh, removal. Awesome. Thanks for, for joining us, Glenn. Greg. If Greg is not on. We'll go to Guy. Hi, uh, Guy Middleton. I'm the lake manager for the Upper Saranac Foundation. And I'm hopeful that uh, we can have a uh, more snowy and enjoyable winter um, before we get into the field season of uh, uh, lake management. Um, I will have to say I, I apologize. I'll have to <clears throat> jump off this meeting uh, in about 15 minutes for a, uh, another meeting. Uh, Guy gave me some um, some updates, so I can share some of those uh, and, and things. And if anybody else has any updates or things they want to send to me, you know, we will uh, send out a follow up email with you know different bullets and some of the links to the things that we talk about in here. Um, is Jackie on? I can see Jackie's name pop up, so I'll go. We'll go to James. Uh, hearing James, we'll go to Jay Fetterman. Hi, Jay Fetterman. I'm with Friends of Moody Pond. I've been a resident of Saranac Lake and living on Moody Pond since 1975. Uh, we, I'm hopeful that we can get the milfoil uh, into a low level steady state. Uh, we're doing quite well. And then uh, focus on overall water quality in the pond. The pond has lots of people circling it, including many dogs. So there's a high um, load of nitrogen that uh, flows into the pond. All right, we'll go to another Jay, Jay Perez. All right, we'll go to Jim. If Jim's not on, we'll try John. Striking out with our Jays, but I think I saw is Kathy or and or Bill on. Hi, Kathy Welch. Um, and uh, I apologize. There's a lot of noise. I'm in another meeting. Um, but uh, I'm from Shattagay Lake, and uh, my husband Bill and I do the Lake Tracker Management Survey for the lake for I think the last five years. And uh, what's already been said, I'm really looking forward to sunshine for the eclipse. Uh, after Kathy, we have some Liz's. We'll go Liz um, Metzger, if she is on. 
Uh, hi, Krista Kennedy here for Liz Metzger, uh, representing the Osable River Association. And um, we're looking forward to a um, good field season where we can hopefully get a lot of research done. Oh, great. Um, Liz Reed. Hi, Liz Reed. I'm with the Paradox Lake Association. I'm a board member and part of the Invasives Committee and uh, looking forward to getting our milfoil in check. And I hope that winter lasts a, a bit longer and we keep the ice and the snow going for a really fun winter. Yes, we need some, we definitely need more snow. Uh, and last but not least, our final Liz. Hey everybody, uh, Liz Schuyler. I'm here with the Adirondack Park Agency. I'm gonna jump on the carnival bandwagon hope and hope that the castle doesn't melt completely by the end of the weekend. All right, uh, Mary. Mary, you're on mute. Thanks. I'm with the Shattuck Lake Foundation. I'm the president, and we are looking forward to our 17th year of milfoil control this season. I'm hopeful that we'll be able to um, improve the cost effectiveness and overall effectiveness of our milfoil control program with uh, integrated management that combines hand harvesting and the use of Priscillapore. Thank you. Meg. Good morning, everyone. Meg Motley with the Lake Champlain Basin Program and New England Interstate Water Pollution Control Commission. Um, I'm the AIS Management Coordinator, and I am hopeful that the efforts to keep Round Gobi from getting into Lake Champlain are successful for another year. Monica. Hi, I'm Monica LaPlante with the Lake George Association. I'm the program director over here, and I'm really looking forward to a season of some really fun new programs that we have going on. And I also agree with Dave. I'm really hopeful about um, this being a new year and being able to work better with the Park Commission. So thank you for saying that, Dave. Natalie. Hi, I'm Natalie Feilhenfeld. Um, I was a first time volunteer last year, and I'm looking forward to another, uh, maybe a little more extensive survey of Lake Simon outside, uh, by Tupper Lake. Great. Um, Neil. And I don't see Neil on, so we'll go to Becca. Hi folks, Becca Bernacki, the Terrestrial Invasive Species Project Coordinator here at ATIP. And I'm hopeful for uh, and optimistic for all the great work our partners and volunteers are going to do in 2024. Um, Bob Bombard. Thanks. I thought you were going to say Robert and I would be in trouble. I thought so it was pretty formal. I was like, <laughs> who is this Robert? Who's yeah, a, the only person who calls me Robert is my mother when I've done something wrong. Um, Bob Bombard, Warren County Soil and Water, uh, Water Resource Specialist, and I'm looking forward to a majority of a summer off for the first time in 30 years. Awesome. Well, you're not going to go too far from us. Nope. Uh, Shannon. And if Shannon's not here, we'll go to Sean. Hey everyone, this is uh, Sean Kittle. Sorry, my camera's not working this morning. I'm the communications coordinator with APIP, and uh, I'm looking forward to Invasive Species Awareness Week uh, this year. It's the first week of June, and we are partnering with a local brewery to make an invasive species themed beer, and we're going to have a really cool event around that. So be on the lookout. Awesome. Great. Um, Steve. Hi, Steve Young here representing the Adirondack Botanical Society. And I'm looking forward to the first wildflower blooms of the spring, which will probably be the newly discovered skunk cabbage in Keene Valley. And um, yes, let's see, uh, Susan. Hi, I'm Susan Whitehurst, and I'm with the uh, Rainbow Lake Association, hopeful for keeping those nasty invasives out of our lake for another year for our decade. <laughs> Tamara. 
Good morning, everyone. I'm Tamara Van Ryn, and I'm the director of APIP. And I'm just hopeful for all of the partnership work that we're going to be able to do this year. I mean, I already heard folks from PICECO talking about spiny water flea research, and then Meg Moanley chiming in with how Plattsburgh might help. And uh, I heard um, about our, our uh, friend from Moody Pond, who's a statistician, so maybe he'll want to jump in and do some statistics on whatever we find out in some lakes. And it's just so great to have so many people on this call that are all interested in keeping our Adirondack waters either free of invasive species or helping to manage them. So looking forward to a summer of great work out on our lakes. Thanks. Let's see, uh, Thomas. And if Thomas isn't on, I think we have Tom with us. If Tom can't join in. We'll go with uh, we'll go with Walter. I'm Walter Hogan, the uh, Director of Invasive Species for the town of Caroga, Fulton County. We're hoping this summer to have a successful pilot using Pacelicor on a 30 plus year invasion of milfoil. And I've never felt winter to be the dark days. I've always loved winter. It's one of the greatest seasons that we have. And I'm very disappointed in what's happened so far this year. Yes, I know. We we have a lot of uh, strong self-selection up here in the Adirondacks for people who really like winter and snow. So uh, I think you have a lot of people who feel the same way. Um, I think I saw Bill Brasso and the AWI team joining us. Yes. Good morning from the shores of Lower St. Regis Lake at Paulsos College. The Here with the Adirondack Watershed Institute team. Um, yeah, great to be here. Great to hear all these voices. And I think I'll say more sunshine for sure. Um, and also one of my colleagues has said, like, to fill all our seasonal positions this year. Yes, that's a good, we, a lot of people feel that way too. Um, let's see, uh, William Bailey. All right, and if William, um, what's on here, we'll go with uh, Zach. Good morning, everyone. Zach Simic, um, conservation and GIS analyst here with APIP. And hate to rain on the winter parade, winter parade here, but I am hopeful that the groundhog's predictions are true and we get an early spring. Uh, I'm going to have to talk with him next time he's in the office. Okay. All right. Uh, anybody else who's on the call that we didn't have? a name for hi uh this is aaron zeman i'm inadvertently uh logged in under liz schuyler my my uh uh co-workers um log in here but i'm aaron zeman project analyst for forest resources at the adirondack park agency and i also uh help manage um permit applications and permit processes for hand harvesting and uh and recently herbicide applications as well uh that come before the adirondack park agency uh, I'm 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 on the the snow bandwagon. We we need some good skiing, and uh, it, it, the ski areas have held up nicely. Uh, the cross country ski areas, um, but I don't think they they have that much left in them. So he's a good dump. A couple other names on here. Bill Bill Woodrig. I see you on here. If you want to say hi. Yeah. Hi. I'm. Uh... I'm Bill Widrig. Uh, I help with uh, my wife, Kathy Welch, uh, up at Shattagay Lake with the uh, Lake Tracker survey work. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm hopeful that uh, this year we'll see a continued downward trend in the amount of milfoil, Brian, from the uh, results from last year. But uh, you never know. And uh, I'm also looking forward to maple syrup season. Awesome. Um Let's see, who else? Ev, Ev, have you chimed in yet? Yep, Ev McNeil Esla, East Shore Screw Lake Association. We work closely with Neil uh, Screw Lake Association. Good news is we still have only two uh, invas aquatic invasives, EM and curly pondweed. 
And Brian, I'm hoping you don't give me any more from the results of the eDNA today. <laughs> yeah. No, look at look at nothing nothing super scary or surprising about that. Um anyone else? Okay, well, we are super thankful for everybody who is here and um, can attend. Um, you know, we will send out an email uh, afterwards with um, a link to this meeting recording. Um, there also will be some bulleted updates from, you know, people have been shared. We're going to share a lot of links about our uh, APIP program. There's also a lot of job openings um, for a lot of different organizations. So we'll, we'll kind of collate that all together and, and put it out to everybody so that you can um, have them and share them around. Uh, so for the next portion, we're going to go with some of our um, some of our larger public partners like the APA, the DEC, like Champlain Basin Program and, and um, APIP. And so we'll give around, you know, a little bit around five minute um, talks highlighting some different things. And then uh, once everybody's done, if there's a few questions for the, the, these larger groups, we can go through and then we'll open it up to everybody uh, at the end. So uh, we'll start off with the Adirondack Park Agency. If Aaron or Liz wanna share anything. Sure do. Uh, okay, so like again, my name is Liz Schuyler and I am the supervisor here for the natural resource analysis. And both Aaron and I are under the umbrella of RAS, which is the Research Analysis and Scientific Services, if you ever see our acronym. Okay, so the updates that I have are, the first one is in regards to Brant Lake. We anticipate that there is a review of the Brant Lake Foundation's herbicide use proposal at the March 2024 um, agency board meeting. So this proposal is going to treat five locations within Brant Lake in May or June of this year. And again, this is to control Eurasia milfoil. There is a, pub, a public comment period open now, and it's going to uh, close by next week, by February 15th. You can submit comments to our agency website, and we can put that link in the chat. Uh, our second announcement is that we have had some application submissions that are going to be anticipated for early spring or summer in places like Highland Forge Lake, East and West uh, Caruga Lake, and Chattagay Lake. We also are anticipating that there will be a complete application soon for Priscilla Core proposed in Horseshoe Pond and Duane. And then our final announcement, which uh, is kind of just piggybacking off of what David Wick has already said, but that the state's appeal of the, the Supreme Court decision for the two Priscilla Core proposals in Lake George is continuing and that those oral arguments are anticipated in Albany in mid to late March. All right, thank you for those updates. Aaron, do you have anything you want to chime in or share? Uh, she pretty much summed it up. That's what we've been working on and uh, what we see coming down the pike. Um, and obviously uh, anyone uh, who's representing any lake association who's looking to do any management that may involve um, agency involvement or review, uh, please feel free to contact me and uh, we can walk through those processes and, and get you started if you're interested uh, in proceeding with uh, treatments that the agency may uh, have some jurisdiction over. Yep, and we strongly encourage all of our lake associations and partners, your first step when you're starting to think about managing aquatic invasive species, one of the first things you should do is reach out to the APA. So um, yeah, Aaron's a great resource. He's helped a lot of the different agency, uh, lake associations and groups and organizations go through this process. So it just makes it a lot easier if you start off in the very beginning communicating then and at the end. All right, I will go next for the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program. And then if any of my colleagues or teammates wanna, wanna, wanna chime in with something, um, we can go through that. Uh, over the winter time, we put out a lot of reports, very proud of our 2023 annual report. Tamara and Sean did a great job of leading, um, even though I, I have a picture of the 22 2022 report up here. Uh, we have a 2023 report and uh, shows all of our different things. 
Um, Becca will probably drop a link in the chat to it. There's also a six page highlight if you don't wanna read the dozens and dozens of pages of everything we've done. So um, it, is, uh, it is available now. I think it does a great job of summarizing and, and showing a lot of the different data. We also have our 2023 uh, AIS early detection report. Um, we've been working with Adirondack Research for the past six years, uh, going out and monitoring different lakes uh, all across that. We've part of a program that we've actually done for nine years. And um, we broke the Adirondack region into three different sub-regions. And we've actually gone through each of those regions three times now. So that program has um, uh, run its course. It it's did what we needed to do and was very successful. And so that program will be kind of sunsetting for us in 2024, um, but we'll continue it in other ways. And we'll talk about that. But the 2023 report is online and anybody can access it. Um, every year, thanks to the great work of our APIP staff, our Lake Protectors volunteers, uh, partner organizations, people like the uh, APA and DEC, so all across there, um, people go out and they're monitoring lakes and water bodies for aquatic invasive species. So this program has been going on since 2002. And this is the chart just showing the number of water bodies that have been monitored. So um, last year we had 184 surveys done on 141 lakes and water lakes and streams or water bodies. Um, 184 is the highest number of surveys we've ever had. Um, some of those are repeat ones on the same water body. So uh, it actually comes out to 141 individual water bodies. So slightly below our uh, all time high, but still a really good number. And you know we're really interested in you know, working with everybody again to keep our eyes out, looking on our favorite lakes and streams across the region, and you can help us keep up this really high number. So we could not do this without you. Uh, the downside of going out and looking in a lot of places is that we did find some new invasions. If you go into our annual report, there's less in full detail about where they were. Um, the vast majority of these were in hydrologically connected water bodies. So where we, we already knew of an invasion in one water body and we suspected that the, the downstream lake or a connected water body also might, most likely would have it, but it just hadn't been surveyed. So we spent a lot of time using our databases and using our modeling to, to really like hone in. And um, that did find things. Uh, we had well, one new in, invasion of curly leaf pondweed, six new ones for very relief, milfoil, three of Eurasian, water milfoil, two of water chestnut, four new Chinese mystery snail, and one new European frog bit. Um, all of this information is also available on um, IMAP invasives. So you can go in there and you can see them in those places. So when you add up over the 20 plus years of monitoring, we are currently sitting at 499 water bodies. When we got all the way to the end, I was like, ah, dang it, I wish I had known, would have gone out and just found one more to do. Um, so uh, we need your help to get the 500. I think maybe we should even do a contest, see who, who the first person who, who does that 500th lake um, for our 20 plus years, we should give them a, a, some special to do. So um, you can see that, you know, since 2017, the past seven years, we've added over 100 new water bodies to uh, our database of that we've gone out and monitored. And the different colors on this bar graph shows uh, how many invasive species are in those water bodies. And if you look at it, the vast majority, 75% um, of our water bodies have no known observations of the 16 aquatic invasive species that we track. So. Um, you know, this is part due to our great efforts uh, to do prevention, um, really led by the Adirondack Watershed Institute and their boat stewards that we're very lucky to have over there and all of our lake associations who are championing that clean, drain, dry message. So, um, you know, we really wanted to keep it that way. All those people who said that they're hopeful about keeping invasive species out. The good news is that 
if you take the simple steps of clean, drain, dry, and going to our decontamination stations before you bring any type of equipment, canoes, kayaks, water skis, jet skis, boats, um, into there, you know, that really greatly reduces the likelihood that we're transporting invasive species. So in 2024, we are going to continue the, um, our monitoring efforts. We will continue our Lake Protectors program. We will have uh, three trainings. We will have uh, the first one in June will be a virtual one. So anybody will be able to uh, uh, log in and, and watch that. Uh, we will do an in-person one in July that's going to be in the in the Caroga area in the southern part. And then we'll do another one in August where we haven't figured out the exact location for that, but um, we'll make sure to share that. And that's where you can come. You'll be able to learn the species identification, um, use some of the tools, practice using a rake toss uh, like this in this photo, and um, you know get hands-on experience touching some of the things, uh, the, the plants and animal species. So that kind of can help with the learning process. Um, we will also continue our lake management tracker program. Uh, we had seven different water bodies participate in uh, 2023, and we have a few more that have actually said they want to sign up and expand. So that's for our communities that are doing management, mainly typically on um, invasive milfoils, and it's a monitoring program that really helps them understand how effective their, their monitoring is with it. Um, we've also put in an abstract to highlight some of the great things that we've learned over the past uh, six years of doing this program. Um, so we'll hopefully be speaking at the nice full uh, annual conference about that. Uh, we will be continuing some uh, eDNA surveys that we did. We just got our results back yesterday from the 2023 sampling um, as part of a statewide effort. The good news is, as we expect, the Adirondacks is the least invaded. We see the lowest number of positive detections for uh, the 54 different species that we tested for on 22 different lakes. Um, so um, you'll see some future updates about, about that coming up, but um, yeah, it's a good tool to help us monitoring. And I uh, wanna just say that we are, we are hiring and um, maybe Becca can put in the link to our, our website where we're hiring for seasonal positions, but also for a um, full-time terrestrial position. So if you can help us spread the word or you know some people who might be interested, they can, they can apply online. Um, uh, we will have an aquatic invasive species seasonal uh, again, and that position, you need to have your application in, I think by February 12th, so it's coming up. Um, a couple of projects that we are looking to, specific projects to do. Um, we're hopeful to continue our Lake Champlain boat launch removal project. We did that in 2023. We gained a ton of data, had a lot of really good information, and we would like to continue it in two of the boat launches. So uh, working with Meg and the Lake Champlain Basin program who funded this, um, they have some additional funding that we can extend this project. So we're working on getting that paperwork through and making that happen. And then we're interested in kind of comparing um, the eDNA monitoring method to topwater surveys that use visual and rate toss methods to see how these two different monitoring techniques compare. So we're hopeful to do some, some of those projects on some lakes in the Adirondacks. And last, um, Last year, we talked a lot about our within lake vulnerability web map. This is where we took all the great data from our 20 plus years of monitoring all the IMAP invasives data that people put in, uh, our sonar data, land use data, and we put this all into um, a, a model. We worked with a company, a data scientist called TetraTech, and we were able to build this model that predicts areas that are, um, that are likely for aquatic invasive plants to establish. And this is now available online at this web link. And I will stop sharing this PowerPoint and I can share, let me find, I think I can share this right here and let's see if I have it open. Let's see, let's see. 
Um, somewhere around here. Yeah, right here. There we go. Okay, so you should be able to see a should be able to see an, uh, a web map. Let's see if it'll load up. Uh, hopefully you can see this now. Um, big thanks to Zach. He was a real big help with getting this online. Uh, because of the way we built the model, we were able to do this for not just the 499 lakes that we've been monitoring, but every lake greater than uh, five acres in size in the Adirondacks, so thousands and thousands of lakes. And so you can pretty much zoom into, um, you know, just about any lake and you'll see these kind of color code that are go through here. And these are predicting the pixels, a 10 by 10 meter pixel of saying uh, how likely it is on this color scale from 50% to 100% that an invasive plant will likely to establish in there. And how we recommend that people use this is that there's a, there's a slider or a filter feature on here. And so, you know, you can go in here and see here's like Racket Pond and Simon Pond. You can see, okay, it's highlighting some of these areas, but it makes it really kind of a little bit more useful if you kind of put the prediction to like a little bit higher level. I think doing like the 75 or 80 is kind of a good, um, good things. And then, you know, really just kind of focus on like the broad brush area. So you can see in Racket Pond, this is a big area that lights up in this north side. Um, you know, this this little north part of this bay right here. You don't need to like focus so much as saying like, oh yeah, just the individual um, 10, 10 by 10 pixel. Uh, I would say more, think of it as a general area. So see the forest, not the trees kind of thing. So um, this link is available, you can go out. And what this would tell you is that these are some probably hot spots that you should spend a little bit more time looking at uh, for your, your water body. Maybe that means extra rake tosses, maybe that means um, doing a snorkel uh, survey there, maybe more eDNA sampling in that area. So hopefully it'll be a tool that can help you identify which areas of your water body are more likely to be invaded by plants. All right, well, that is all that I have for, for the Adirondack team. If there's anybody else for APIP that wants to chime in, And I'll just chime in quickly, Brian, that we are asking all of our partners to submit their data for our data dashboard. We know some of you are running boat steward programs. Uh, some of you are hard, are doing milfoil management that we might not know about. We'd love to count everybody's efforts across the entire Adirondack Park and roll that up into one dashboard. I think most of you have gotten the link. Um, I'll put a link in the chat to where the data form is and Thanks to some folks like Moody Pond and a few others, I think Lake George Park Commission, a couple others I know have already gotten their data in. And that's awesome. And I thank you. And last year was our first time doing this. And it really is the only place where we're able to, again, as I said, roll up all of the accomplishments of what everyone's doing across the Adirondack Park. So it's pretty exciting. I'll put a link in the chat to this year's data form. And I'll also put a link in the chat to last year's dashboard. Yep, that data definitely helps us. So please take a few quick minutes to fill that out. Um, all right, next I will go to uh, some DEC. I got some statewide updates from Kathy McGlynn and uh, Aaron, if you also wanna chime in with anything you're more than happy to do. Uh, the, the state is gonna be continuing doing leading hydrilla management projects, um, some projects centered around Cayuga Lake and the Finger Lakes and the Erie Canal in Western New York. Um, they, the Invasive Species Grants Program, they've uh, awarded 43 grants. We have several people in our region who got this. So definitely reach out. I've already talked with several of, of them um, so we can make sure we're coordinating and, and helping out, but that's really exciting. Uh, they are also hiring, they're hiring a regional AIS coordinators in region five and region seven. There is a new statewide watercraft inspection steward program. That's WISP coordinator, Scott Jamison. So that's a really great uh, resource for all of our WISP programs and boat steward programs. 
And um, as always, all across the state, and especially here in the Adirondacks, we're looking to hire hundreds of positions for boat stewards and people to do the decontamination. So um, help us spread the word about those jobs and opportunities. I can, um, Brian, I'll chime in a little for another um, position that we're hiring for. So I don't know how many of you got to meet Eric Reardon, who worked out of our Warrensburg office as our aquatic invasive species outreach specialist along the Champlain Canal. And um, he moved on to a new position, sadly. So we are in the currently in the process of looking to hire a replacement for Eric. And so he did a lot of outreach, uh, both about the round goby work that's being done along the Champlain Canal to slow its spread through there. And then also working with the local stakeholders to build awareness for the different um, options and work that's being done to look at an AIS barrier within the Champlain Canal system. And so I think I saw Meg posting about it too in the, the chat. So check there for more details. Um, and then I just wanted to also mention to the group that um, I, I collaborate with Meg at the Lake Champlain Basin Program and then Kim Jensen at Vermont DEC to help with some of the harvesting of water chestnut in the Lake Champlain. And um, we contract with the town of Dresden to do aquatic harvesting in the South Bay and a few other areas in the South end of the lake um, is the work that I engage with on that program. And so we have a new five-year contract in place with the town of Dresden. So um, if you drive by South Bay and seeing those aquatic harvesters out there working hard to remove water chestnut, um, both to limit their impact in South Bay as well as make it less likely that it'll get moved to inland lakes in the Adirondacks. So those were the two I wanted to chime in on. Great, yes, as you can see, lots and lots of people hiring. So if you know anybody who wants a job and wants to come to the Adirondacks, we have lots of opportunities for them. So we will send out the, the links to this um, and then follow up email to everybody. And yes, please help us spread the word. And uh, Meg, good segue for you at the Lake Champlain Basin Program. Daughter of Great. Canada. Thanks, Brian. Um, it is February. I can't believe it's February. This field season is coming so fast. Um, I, too, should have added that I'm hopeful that we can fill all of our boat launch tour positions um, on the Vermont, Quebec, and northern New York side of Lake Champlain. Um, <clears throat> we have a really high rate of return stewards this year, which is really positive, but we're in the active process of hiring for the other positions. Um, so that's open. And I, maybe I'll put that in the link too. Um, luckily, we sometimes when we get candidates that apply that would be better suited to be at a New York DEC launch, we just redirect them to AWI um, so we can help support each other's programs. Um, this summer being 2024 is the three years since we released the last State of the Lake report for Lake Champlain. So we are actively finalizing data and graphics and putting together messaging for the state of the lake, Lake Champlain 2024, which will be released in June of this year. Um, we have been collaborating um, across the Vermont Invasive Patroller Program and the APIP um, Invasive Species um, Monitoring Program to create a program called CHAMP, which is for Champlain monitoring of aquatic invasive species. Um, and so we're really looking to enhance um, engagement from New York participants on the New York side of Lake Champlain to help us survey Lake Champlain sections of shoreline um, for invasive species. Um, so we will continue to collaborate with Brian on that and, and get out messaging about training for that. Um, but if you know anybody who lives along the shoreline of Lake Champlain, or if you're eager and willing to participate, we'd love more participation. Um, we're excited to kick off uh, Eurasian Water Milfoil Genetics uh, Research Project this field season. So SUNY Oneonta um, received a research grant from the Lake Champlain Basin Program in Nuipec to do um, an assessment across, uh, I think it's a total of 30 lakes um, and Lake Champlain to look at the genetic variability in the Eurasian water milfoil populations. And 
Um, again, we're looking there to see if there's any implications for management um, in terms of different resistance to herbicides um, or other issues there. So um, excited to kick that work off and also to help link that work up into a national genetics, like a gen bank database so that um, we're represented across the Adirondacks and the Lake Champlain watershed in that, <clears throat> in that database. Um, we also are gonna support um, a UVM extension, University of Vermont extension project to do round goby um, modeling impacts to Lake Champlain um, to help answer some of those um, how much and where type of questions that the public has if goby get into Lake Champlain. Um, so that's another big one. And then we're really working hard to get all of our field season grants through the contracting process and through the quality assurance project plan process so that um, our management and prevention programs in the Adirondack region are ready to go for this field season. Aaron covered water chestnut. We are in constant response and investigations into preventing and slowing the spread of round goby from the north in the Richelieu River to Lake Champlain, as well as in the south through the Champlain Canal. Um, and we have a new interest in tracking and identifying um, any grass carp that might show up in the watershed and doing analysis to identify chemically where they might have originated from um, and if they might be able to reproduce. So that's the, the summary for Lake Champlain. Awesome, thank you, Meg. And we're very lucky to have a third of our region covered by the Lake Champlain Basin Program. And I know the people who are on those watersheds are very appreciative of the support and the great projects that we're doing. So I'm really excited about that, uh, the milfoil genetics one. So that'll be great to learn from. All right, uh, does anybody have any questions for our partners? You can come off mute or you can use the, uh, the raise hand feature. I have a question, Brian. This is Susan Whitehurst. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, the mystery snails. Um, we have heard a number of references, of course, to, to milfoil, but I noticed the snails uh, came up new in four places, yep. according to your numbers. And, we, um, and based on Ezra's research, the snails were found in... Uh, Buck Pond, which is not connected to our lake, but about as close as you can get without being connected. Um, so what can what can we learn about uh, the snails? Yeah, so there are several different species of mystery snails. Um, there are ones like bandit mystery snails, Chinese mystery snails, Japanese mystery snails. There's a whole suite of complex of them. Um, overall, they are an under, I think, an understudied species. Um, the the banded mystery snail is fairly extensively widespread in the Adirondacks. That is not one of the 16 species we track. Um, so when you, we say like an invaded lake or an uninvaded lake, that's not counting banded mystery snails. Um, not even counted. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, they are they are there. Um, they are a you know non-native species species the band of mystery snails are i believe from the southeastern united states originally the chinese and japanese are from asia so um so yeah they're they're an invasive the non-native species to our region that comes in and it definitely has some impacts on our native snails and mussels um a lot of the times people don't really notice them too much so they're kind of cryptic they can go through. We do see these boom and bust populations for them. So like this year, we got a lot of, or this year, in 2023, we got a lot of reports of banded mystery snail in the Hamilton County region that people were seeing very large spikes. And so like a, a, their shoreline would be covered with hundreds of thousands of these uh, snails. Um, and then, you know, they, they died off or like they disappeared after that. So, um, so yeah, there, there is some, I, I'm happy to follow up and send you a, a couple different links and some other information. Um, I did go to the, uh, uh, a national conference this past fall. Um, there was some interesting talk about how bandit 
have mystery snails um, upcycle heavy metals in the food chain. So, mm. um, you know, they definitely have some impacts, but, you know, when we think of invasive species, I always like to talk about invasive species, they're like a gradient. There's some invasive species that are, have very strong impacts. There are, you know, our worst invaders, things like hydrilla, zebra mussels, round goby, things we really want to keep out. And then there's some other ones that, that, you know, we definitely want to keep out, but they don't seem to have as strong of impacts on the ecosystems or on our economies. So, but there was a decision in putting your report together, right, to pick the six. The to 16 report species. on the new evasion. So the 16 species that we track. The 16 yeah. that you're tracking. Um, if it's not a big concern, then how's it on the list of the six? new uh, things to look at. You understand my question? Yes. So okay. we, out of our 16 of our list, we have eight plants and we have eight animals. One of the eight animals is a Chinese mystery snail. So we track Chinese mystery snail. Mm -hmm. um, we don't track banded mystery snails, part of our official tallies. Um, we do report them in IMAP. So you can go in IMAP and you can see the reports. We do train our professional staff on it. Um, it's not something we train are like volunteers on just because uh, there's a limit to how many species we can we can teach them. I think overall, if you go into IMAP, you'll see there's 25, maybe 27. Um, you know, if you could run a report and see like, okay, how many total invasive species are in our region? Um, you know, you're going to get around 25, but we're really focused on the 16 ones that have the biggest impact. Okay, and and the boat stewards are trained to look for mystery snails two they're on the list for boat steward training i'll let bill or meg chime in on that one i'm happy to start um our stewards are trained on them it is um it's very uncommon in fact i've never documented the presence of the snails on the watercraft the trailer or the equipment i don't know bill if you're if awi has um, our stewards are now taking additional steps to help survey and monitor launch sites so they are may start turning up there but we're not seeing them um, at least at the life stage where we could identify them mm. um, in in transport overland on boats and trailers uh, at this point. Okay, thank you. Bill, do you have anything else? No, I think, I mean, I think you said it well, Meg. I mean, it's something that's on the list. It's not something that we push hard for, for a lot of reasons that we just haven't seen it, but you know, it also, just by us talking about it right here, we're all looking at each other like, okay, let's just review and make sure that that's, you know, still something that we're training people for, but certainly not the, the high on the list of things from that perspective at this point in time. Yeah, and like Meg said, um, the real risk of these transporting is that uh, the mystery, like the mystery for it, uh, is that they, many of these species can give live young. So when they, they, they essentially birth a fully formed minute, like, you know, millimeter wide uh, young, uh, young adult that grows into a full adult. So, you know, it, the transportation, they, those are their greatest threat and they are essentially almost invisible to the naked eye. But once again, it goes back, if you're following the clean drain dry, if you're going de you're going to a boat station and you're doing the, you know, a decontamination hot wash, that should really greatly, greatly reduce the, the chances that you can, um, that you can, you're transporting anything, even things that you cannot see. Thank you. I guess I just add to that. We haven't seen them at least in our inspections as being like harvested or transported or used for bait in any way. Um, I'm not saying that doesn't happen. I just haven't seen that happening at the boat launches in our inspections and collection of species. All right, so that's a, a good thing to kind of kick us off into, um, you know, kind of some open discussion and, and maybe um, Bill, we can start off with, with, you know, some of you and AWI, I'm sure you have several different announcements, but um, if you have a something you want to share or a question, you can uh, type it in the chat or you can use one of the raised hand features or some other different things. So we are, um, we're just going to have a go, go around if people want to 
chime in and chat. So we'll start off with Brett and Bill and our AWI team. Sounds good. Thanks, Brian. Good morning, everyone. Um, so yeah, uh, my name is Brian and I'm the assistant director for the stewardship program here at AWI. Thanks so much. So I'm going to share a couple updates for where we're at with our stewardship program um, coming up uh, here this spring, and then pass it off to Bill, and he's going to provide a few more updates around some of our education programming that we have going on. So the you know, common theme for a number of people here today is hopeful to fill all of their seasonal positions, which we are no different um, in that regard. And happy to report that we're in a really good spot right now, particularly for being the first February. So right now we have ballpark 50% of our positions filled. So that's, we're looking for about 113 seasonal staff. We have about 42 accepted job offers right now with another 40 that are currently in the process of interviewing, completed interviews, or ones that are so, uh, really good spot, and uh, one thing that's also really you know great to see this year, similar to Meg saying, is that we have so many returners. Um, so the first thirty-eight job offers this year were all fantastic. We're looking at currently sitting somewhere around forty-two, forty-three. Hey, Brett. Your audio is a little in and out, so we've had a little bit of problems hearing you towards the tail end, especially there. Sorry, I missed. Yeah, Brad, your audio is kind of coming in and out, so we can we're hearing some, but not a hundred percent. Sounds good. I'll try to keep it as close as I can. Yes, yeah. you sound better now. All right, that's good. So ultimately, general just there. Uh, we have uh, most of our positions hired, and we have a really high returning rate right now, around 43%, which is fantastic. So we're going to keep keep marching on there. So one thing I just wanted to share with everyone, too, is, is no different than what people are putting into the chat here, just where you can apply for these positions and direct people. So we do continue to have some of our you know, problem areas, which are challenging for us each year to hire for um, individual stewards for specific launches. So just so that these are kind of on the radar for those that are on this call here today, everything kind of in the Old Forge Inlet area tends to be challenging for us, 7th Lake, 8th Lake, 4th Lake, Rocky Mountain, um, Stillwater Reservoir, thank you, Jen, um, as well as then continuing kind of up around the bend, looking at Blue Mountain Lake, Lake Durant, um, Indian Lake, and dropping down to Speculator and Lake Pleasant area. Um, those ones are historically challenging for us to hire for. We do have people there now. We're looking for a few more. Um, Great Sakandaga will also be needing um, more applicants as well as North Champlain are some of our, our main holes right now where we're looking for more. So Sue just put in our link for employment. You can direct anyone to our, um, our just primary uh, Metaronic Watershed Institute uh, website, just adkwatershed.org, and our our main our main page for the website right now is set up as an online portal, so you can just ask anyone right to the website, and they'll, they'll come right up. Um, so yeah, beyond that, no major uh, programmatic changes for us this year. We're running a very similar program as years past, as many of you are familiar with. We will be kicking off our spring training this year on Monday, May thirteenth, uh, with a hybrid training of online and in person, and then we will be. Uh, out in full force for Memorial Day weekend starting Friday, May 24th, and we'll be out there through Labor Day weekend with the extended conference we don't have that many locations. The general outlook for the stewardship program is now, and I'll pass it over to Bill for a couple more education updates. Great. Morning. Thanks for putting up with our limited technology here. <laughs> Um, hope they can hear me okay. Um, so we're so known, AWI is so known, you know, Adirondack Watershed Institute is so known for our stewardship program, um, and rightfully so, right? And we also do just a, a lot of education. I won't get a lot into it. Um, through our education outreach, I'll send, as um, Brian had said, um, I'll send you some notes so that you can share with other folks who are interested. Um, definitely encourage you to take a look. But three things, just real quick, is that we are expanding our spread prevention workshops that we conduct with both lake associations as well as other organizations. We started last year in the Lake Champlain Basin with some funding from Lake Champlain Basin Program. Thank you, Meg. Um, so that's across the park now where we do AIS ID, watercraft inspection, and most importantly, and what was most 
compelling by the participants last year as far as feedback was how do you talk to others about this work and then how do you how do how can they help or what can they do to make a difference you know from that point of view so definitely if you know anyone if you're part of a group or whatever like send an email love to talk um we're also next this year we'll be doing our third year of our junior watersheds stewardship program which is like this booklet um, that will soon be available online, but but the way it's intended to be, if you see a steward, um, you have a booklet, they can fill out the booklet, they have conversations with steward um, about this work that we've been talking about, um, and with completion of the booklet, similar to like Ranger program, if folks are familiar with the Park Service, um, you get a certificate, you get a sticker, um, it's been super, um, really well received by the youth and by, um, by parents and guardians and such like that, so I just want to say that. Um, the last one I'll share is that um, this year, um, another hire that we're doing um, is looking for an education assistant. We had one last year. We have another one planned for this year. And that education assistant is available across the board to all folks in here as someone who can come and do like a presentation, have conversations, what have you. Um, last year, we were down in Caroga. We were really successfully down there working with, I think it's like 40 kids. Um, so just want to say that there's another resource that we that you all we can take advantage of in spreading this um, the good word about um, preventing the spread of, of the aquatic basis species and water quality and such. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you for the time, Brian, and, and yeah, thank you. Mary, I see you have a question. You raise a hand. Uh, yes, I had a question um, about the. Uh stewards um at, at the boat launches and because we're so close to lake champlain um i'm and we're, we're getting more concerned about invasive organisms like spiny water flea and just hearing about the round goby and um we're wondering is there any part of the training that that uh when stewards ask and someone is from lake champlain for example that they're encouraged to go to uh, the decontamination station. I mean, is there any kind of screening that's part of their training to to do that? Yeah, good question. Um, and I can certainly respond to it and others might have can jump in, including Meg, but certainly that is a question. And we we recognize that, you know, Lake Champlain and Wells as well as a number of other water bodies, both, you know, in the park and outskirts of the park and beyond the park, right? Um, have invasive species that could invade other places, right? So that is a question and our stewards are both, we talk about it, we train it, we follow up. They have, they have each of the, um, each of the stewards have a listing of these places so they can keep it in their awareness of like, oh, you're from here. You know, we will highly recommend because we know it is a volunteer program, highly recommend that, for example, you get decontaminated for that. So you don't um, have any chance of spreading that, even if you don't see it, but we recommend it. Okay. I'm sure Mike will jump in. Yeah, I mean, I just add that I think we feature in the training for both the Adirondack stewards and the Lake Champlain stewards that Lake Champlain is a source lake. We review very clearly what organisms are present. And when we have our stewards on the Lake Champlain boat launch sites, they're really prioritizing watercraft that is exiting Lake Champlain with intentions to go to uninvaded water bodies. So those watercraft are prioritized for clean drain and dry on exit from Lake Champlain from around the lake, um, as well as the stewards knowing what to look for. And of course, then if I was a steward at a receiving water body, just say somebody came off of Lake Champlain at a time of day when there wasn't a steward there, I would be keyed that this is a high risk watercraft because it was last in Lake Champlain and I would give it extra scrutiny before I would allow it to launch into another inland water body. That will, Mike. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he was right. Yeah, very good, very good points. And, you know, uh, I'll put in one other plug for, we're very lucky to have the Adirondack Watershed Institute here at Paulsmans College. They do so much. Um, uh, another program that's a, uh, I strongly recommend is their Adirondack Lake Assessment Program. Um, I encourage all lake associations, communities to participate, not just in aquatic invasive species, annual monitoring, you should be doing water quality monitoring. So if you're doing ALAP or CSLAP, you know, they're both really good 
good ones to do. So um, there's lots of interconnections between water quality and invasive species. So uh, good to be doing that monitoring also. Um, anybody else who has a question or wants to share something? Walter. Walter, you're on mute right now. So if you unmute, hopefully. I guess I got it now. I thought I was unmuted. I hear you. Um, yeah, I wanted I wanted to thank um, or recommend the AWI to come to your different agencies and programs that you have for their education. We had it at Caroga last summer and in our day program for our youth, and it was really well received, and they had a great time with it. So that was very positive. Um, I had two questions uh, that I wanted to ask. Well, one question and and one possibility. I don't know. If anybody is out there using, um, I've been doing some research on the Garmin live sonar, um, and it looks like in talking to the company and in what I've seen on the internet and so on, it's really equivalent to having a diver under the water going along looking for your invasive species. You actually see live pictures of the plants and the, and the resolution is so good you can actually identify them underwater. Now, I haven't used it personally, and we're trying to collect the money to try to buy one to use. So I'm wondering if anybody out there is familiar with it, has used it. Is it as good as it appears that it is? Uh, that would be helpful for us to know. And and then just the last part, and then if anybody has anything, they can respond. Um, we are doing a Priscilla core pilot next summer, this coming summer, excuse me, uh, late May, early June, we're not sure yet of the exact time, in three select spots within one in West Caroga and two in East Caroga. So um, if anybody is interested in seeing how it happens uh, and then possibly uh, coming back in a few days to see the results and so on, we'd be more than happy to have you come along and see uh, how it works. So I'm just opening that up to people. Brian, I can jump in on Garmin um, technology. So three major manufacturers now, Garmin, Lurance, and Hummingbird, they all have live imaging now at this point. And so Garmin's is referred to as LiveScope. So I have had the opportunity to use it on a number of different boats and through the ice and, and things of that nature. So it is incredible technology. You are able to see live imaging from underwater and you can cast out about 200 feet in each direction and scan around and actually look. Um, definitely very skeptical for being able to identify species. What it does do very well is when you dial in your settings and, and you, you upscale some of your equipment, um, you are able to see really good definition of what is a rock, what is a stick, what is a full tree upside down, what is a weed bed looking like. However, in terms of being able to identify native vegetation versus um, invasive species, that is going to be extremely difficult. Where it could be used is in areas with limited vegetation. You can use that tool to scan around in deeper, murkier water and identify beds that are subsurface and to then be able to then go dive on and look at. But in areas that are dense vegetation, tens of acres, it's going to be a really difficult technology to actually get any gains from it without getting it there. Uh, one of the things that I, that I, we were happy about with it is that you can also it uploads your your location in the in the computer system, so you have a permanent record of where you've been. Yes, and correct. Yep, yep. Yeah. It's all GPS enabled, and you can also do screen recording um, with these units now. So you can take you know a fifteen minute clip of surveying a bay there. You can go back later on, put it up onto a laptop or a computer of some sort, and then go back and review that data. Right. There's a difficulty we have now is when we when we're looking for something, we have a low rants, uh, just, which is strictly just a uh, bounce back radar. So we know something's there, but we don't know. It could be it could be an old boat as far as we know. But in any event, you have to bring a diver off the harvester to come back and actually dive down and physically look at it. So that takes away from their productivity on, on removing the milfoil. So we're looking to, to, you know, eliminate that where we can just have one person in a boat and find these things and say, we got a pretty good possibility here. Uh, but even in shallow water, you don't think, I mean, most of our milfoil is in six to eight, maybe 10 feet of water. You think that, that it would be able to identify pretty well? or you're... 
You'll be able to identify it well in the sense of like to the, the general structure of the plant. But the problem is, is once you have a, a, a bed of it and it, it, it's going to show up as just a massive plant. When you have an individual mm -hmm. um, cluster of Eurasian water milfoil, six or seven stems coming up, things like that, you'll be able to see that pretty well as a standalone plant. Um, but at that rate, there's still six possibilities of what, what species you're actually looking at, native versus non-native. That, that will definitely be challenging. But I think where it, it will be highlighted is when you're looking for vegetation and rocky water, which is just going to be difficult to see. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll piggyback real quick on it. You know, there are different levels of sonars and as the sonars get better, you get better definition. You know, even with some of these basic sonars, you know, we, we train our teams like a good person who has some experience that like you can tell, you know, you can see this sort of like, okay, yeah, that, you know, I might not be able to visually see down because of the water quality or the depth, but I know there's something there. So maybe I need to do an extra rake toss or maybe I need to go into the water to actually look at it. So, um, and there are, there are software and we've used software programs where you can actually take those recordings of the sonar and upload them to programs and they can give you things like, you know, how deep it is, mapping, um, how, how soft or hard your, your sediment is. Um, and then also some ones will give you the height of um, plants in the water column. So it is a useful tool um, and you're more than welcome uh, to use it or reach out to talk with us. And I'll just say, Walter, you know, I think as a, more communities are moving into this, um, using doing integrated management, you know, using chemical management as part of it, you know, that we can all learn from each other. I know that, you know, Minerva Lake, um, Steve McNally, uh, I was talking with Jim, I believe they went out and they talked with, you know, you and Kuroga. So, you know, from Lake Luzerne. So, you know, we all can learn from each other. And I think, you know, sharing data, uh, reaching out, sharing your stories, your experience, that's what's gonna help our partners. And that's a, the real great value of APIP is we are collaboration, we're a partnership. Right, and our plan will be to report back to you for sure exactly how we've done, how, what we're seeing and so on and so forth to share with everybody. Thank you, Walter. Um, I see that Bruce has a raised hand. Thank you, Brian. Uh, yeah, Bruce Burdett, once again, from Indian Lake, Mountain View Lake, uh, the northernmost in the outer Rondack Park, up in the house had Mountain View. I wonder if anybody has any data or information on uh, the bubblers that people use to um, keep the ice away from their boathouses and docks. If that has any effect on uh, uh, growth of the Eurasian water milfoil. We have a bunch of people in one section that um, they're all next door neighbors more or less and they use they use bubblers or a uh, uh, propeller circulator type unit. And it seems like to me like that area is getting more and more milfoil in the summer, but I'm not sure. I'm wondering if anybody has any data on that. I'll let other people chime in. I personally have not heard data about it. I have heard people you know, ask these questions. There is some, I know, research that is going on, you know, generally across the United States about, you know, how these bubblers impact on, you know, water quality or, um, you know, sedimentation or other different uh, impacts. So I've not specifically seen any studies that look at specifically raising water milfoil, but um, we can look around. And if anybody else knows of anything, please chime in. Brian, we do have a question from Steve Young in the chat. He asks, do you know how good iNaturalist is at identifying aquatic plants? Yeah, um, that's that's another good question. So now we have a lot of these um, automated, uh, you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence, things like Seek or iNaturalist that are surprisingly very good for our terrestrial plants at identifying things. Um, they tend to do, in my personal experience using them, they tend to do less well with aquatics because when you, most of the time you have to try to remove the plant, um, you know, you take it out of the water or you're trying to float it, get a picture in the water or floating, you know, it doesn't do as good a job of getting um, all the features. And we also just don't have as much data. Our aquatic species are not 
as well represented in these databases to train the machines on. So in general, it seems to do a little bit poorer than uh, the terrestrial ones. But it, you know, can try it out. You know, like um, I'm trying to think. I had one person contact me like, oh yeah, you know, like Seek said it was this milfoil, you know, and I was like, I can't remember if they said like, oh, it said it was Eurasian. You know, I'm like, no, that's variable, you know. So like, eh, maybe you got it to genus, like it's kind of close. All right, well, if there's give one last call, if people have any, any questions or information, I see Sue chimed in on the chat saying, I make sure my students don't use tools like Seek or iNaturalist for confirmation, especially when they're looking at plants out of water. Yeah, submerged plants usually look very different once they're out of the water because the features basically collapse. Yeah, if you think about it, when you pull that, that milfoil, it has those nice feathery leaves that are all splayed out in the water and then you pull it right out and they just kind of collapse along the stem. So it's really hard for the computer to pick up on that pattern when um, it's not the same, so. Hey, Brian, this is Steve. Yep, hey. Um, <clears throat> there is a new aquatics manual out by uh, Hellquist. I don't know if you have that yet. I, I did hear that it was coming out. I have not seen it. Uh, yeah, I haven't either. I haven't gotten it yet. And uh, I just wondered if people, if there are any groups of plants that people really need better ID keys or, um, you know, ways to identify certain groups of species that they just really can't find good ID info. This is a, the challenge sometimes we have is the different milfoils. It's hard to tell the difference. Some are easy, some are not so easy. Yeah, especially when you factor in the native milfoils, um, you know, I think we've done a very good job of training people of saying, you know, when I'm out at a boat launch or different things, we talk about invasive species, they're like, oh yeah, the milfoils, you know, and then sometimes they get confused when we start going further in the conversation and there's, we tell them, oh, well, there's actually native milfoils in there. We had, uh, we had a, uh, a person come upon um, a, some really large beds of milfoils this past summer. And when we got some good photos and samples of it, I think it turned out to be, um, I can't remember, Bob, which one was it? Farwells? I, mean, it was, I think it was either Farwells or World Verticillata. Um, and yeah, you know, like sometimes they can look, you know, pretty close to them. So, uh, so milfoils is typically the one that we get the most questions about. Ezra, see, he has a raised hand. Hey there, everybody. I have to jump off the call, but I just wanted to, um, first, let APIP know that I really appreciate uh, everything that you've done in serving as your early detection team for aquatics for the last six years. Um, it's been it's been a really great program, so thank you. And uh, lastly, I just wanted to make an announcement that we are now a registered pesticide business with New York State, and we're doing terrestrial work this summer in uh, with the plan of continuing our lake survey work, but also getting into um, some aquatic management with herbicides in the future. So I just want to let everybody know that. Yep. Azure's also hiring, so we'll send out one of his links in our follow-up in our follow-up emails. So um Steve, another kind of just general kind of species we do sometimes get some people uh, who have expressed challenges with some of our uh, some of the like, you know, the smaller lily pads. So um, European frog bit, you know, American frog bit, little floating heart. Mm -hmm. um, Interesting. You know, some of those yeah, I can see things. that. But mainly milfoils is probably our most common one. So I put a link to the new aquatic manual in the chat.
Okay, thank you for sharing that. Um, let me see if I can get back to my things. A uh, few things just to wrap up with. Um, let me find where we're at. Okay. Um, our, like I said, our APIP annual report is now available. Here's the 2023 cover cover page, um, picture from Lake Champlain. Uh, so you can follow the links to go through there. Just another reminder to submit your partnering data. Uh, we are planning on April 25th, a partner meeting. Details about the exact location and um, what we're going to be doing will be forthcoming, but but to save the date, we would love to see some of you in person if you can make it out to that. Um, also, if you've been enjoying these webinars, we will have our Adirondack Lake Ecology webinar. We had a really good one on forest ecology, and you can see that on our YouTube page. But March 6th, you can um, come and listen to me and um, Peter Tobiasen. Uh, professor from Union College, talk about lake ecology and invasive species. Uh, also a reminder that right now is our forest pest hunters for hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, you can go out and survey through April 9th and report back on IMAP. You can go on our website, see how you can get involved, learn how to do that. It's a great program, especially if you like to hike and be outside in the, in the winter time. And just a couple of conferences and learning opportunities. Uh, the New York State Federation of Lake Association, their annual conference is gonna be May 3rd and 4th in Lake George. Um, submitted an abstract to talk about our lake management tracker program. There's usually lots of great talks. Many of us usually attend there, so that's a great resource. Uh, if you're really super into this and wanna go a little bit further afield, the International Conference on Aquatic Invasive Species is actually gonna be in Halifax. Nova Scotia. Uh, I will not be going to that one, but some of the other people on here will be going to that, but that would be really cool to go to. And then um, our Northeast Aquatic Plant Management Society, they're doing a plant camp uh, in September then in New Jersey. This is a great opportunity if you want to go and learn how to ID a lot of these different species. If you want to learn about management, meet a lot of the different professionals. Um, I went to the first one. It was a really great opportunity. Hey, Brian, there's also the Northeast Natural History Conference coming up in April, and there will be invasive sessions there. That's right. Is that in Albany? Right. April 19th. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll try to put include that in the follow-up links also. So lots of great learning opportunities. We're super fortunate to have a lot of different resources, a lot of different experts, a lot of different organizations. So uh, hopefully your message is that if you need somebody, you can meet somebody and uh, you know they can help direct you to the right 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 answer, right potential solutions. So with that, I wanna say thank you for everybody for attending. Um, you know, you can reach out to us through our website at adkinvasive.com. You can see the upcoming events on our events page. We also have all the Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, so you can keep track of us, of us there. And thank you so much for joining with us with our today. And I hope that you stay hopeful for the rest of the year. And I look forward to seeing some of you when you return back to our region and we get to get out on our unfrozen lakes and paddle and boat around. Thanks, Brian. Thank all you right, all. Yep, bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us. All right, there we go.